So, uh, the MMA legend has it that a couple of years ago, Dana White was in negotiations to uh, arrange a fight between Brock Lesnar and Fedor Emelianenko. Now, depending on who you ask, some say it was going to be in Madison Square Garden, others say at Dallas Cowboys Stadium. You know, either way, it would have been a really, really interesting matchup. Probably the biggest pay-per-view uh, UFC show in history. Uh, but a lot of uh, things never really came to pass. Uh, something about Fedor's uh, managers not really want to agree to certain terms. So, unfortunately, what would have been far and away the biggest fight in MMA history just never came to fruition. Now, I bring this up because, A, it would have been awesome if it happened. And secondly, guess who recently decided to come out of retirement? Fedor Milenko, the last emperor, a.k.a. Uh, the greatest uh, MMA artist of all time, certainly the greatest uh, heavyweight mixed martial artist ever. Uh, for those of you who don't know who he is, and if you're watching a video about Fedor Milenko, you better know who Fedor Milenko is. I mean, it just goes without saying. Uh, got his uh, start in Sambo, uh, went to Pride, beat Big Nog, and uh, pretty much went undefeated for a decade. Just dominated everybody, beating up Mirko. Cop, beat up Big Nog a couple times, Heath Herring, a whole bunch of Japanese dudes. Uh, then he came to the U.S., beat up, uh, oh goodness, he beat up Andrew Olofsky, he beat up him, beat up Tim Sylvia, beat up, uh, not Kimbo Slauson, the guy, Brett Rogers. So, I mean, he's a bad dude. Uh, he was a bad dude up until uh, around uh, June 2010 when he got tapped by Fabrice Overdue. It was his first legitimate loss in MMA competition ever. And after that, he went on a uh, three-fight losing streak. Now he dropped a fight to Bigfoot Silva in a fight that really made Fedor look terrible. That was even worse than the first loss. And then he got KO'd by uh, Dan Henderson in a 205 catchweight bout. So after that, he left Strike Force and went over to Russia and did a lot of uh, money mark fights. He's fighting against a dude who really had no business in the octagon or the rope or the ring or whatever uh, form of uh, fighting apparatus they use over there in the Soviet Union. And he's been up dudes like Pedro Rizzo, you know, guys who are really, really beyond their props. They kind of padded his schedule. You know, he lost his three fights and then he won, I think, like, you know, four in a row fighting really, really uh, old dudes who are not relevant remotely at all anymore. So anyway, he hung him up about three years ago and he recently made the announcement that, you know what, he's decided to unretire. He's coming back to the world of mixed martial arts. And of course, as soon as he made that announcement, first thing you gotta say is, okay, well, does this mean Fedor Milenko will finally come to the UFC? Now, Fedor Emelianenko is easily the greatest mixed martial artist to never step foot in the octagon. You know, we wanted to see him come in there for really a decade now. And uh, it's probably one of the, the biggest uh, what could have been. You know, if Fedor would have crossed over the UFC uh, way back in the day, you know, how would he have done against guys like Randy Couture? How would he have done against guys like Boss Root and uh, a lot of these other uh, heavyweights, Gabriel Gonzaga, back when he was worth a hoot? And now, the prospects of Fedor coming back, you know, we're kind of on the fence because traditionally, the problem with getting Fedor to sign to anything has been his management because he has the, uh, what's it, M1? I think that's the name of it, Global M1, M1 Global, something like that. Well, anyway, they're a bunch of uh, Russian gangsters, figuratively speaking, of course, uh, who come up with like really just outrageous demands for buys. And they want a lot of money. And they want these stupid stipulations. And I think they want something about, you know, the, the broadcast rights, something that UFC with the Fox deal and the Reebok deal just isn't going to happen for sure anymore. So that alone uh, is a pretty big barrier to uh, Fedor ever coming to the UFC. But you know what? Since he had those losses, since he went into exile for a while, and the fact that simply there's only really, you know, two legitimate mixed martial arts organizations, well, maybe 30 to get one season fighting, if you're counting that, you're really grasping for straws. It seems only logical that if Fedor was going to come out and start fighting full-time, it would have to be for the UFC. Now, would Bellator make him an insane offer? Probably. Will World Series of Fighting make him an insane offer? You know what? That would not surprise me either. Uh, both those organizations are really, really strapped for a, a big marquee name. And really, you know, marquee names really don't get bigger than Fedor Emelianenko. And it would especially be worthwhile for uh, Bellator because their heavyweight division is just utter rot. You know, guys like uh, Vitaly Minikoff and who's the other guy? There's another dude over there who's always uh, 
Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Just put it this way. They have a really bad heavyweight division. Way worse than the UFC, and the UFC's probably an all-time low. So, like I said, I mean, it could possibly happen. You know, Bellator could back up the money truck and, you know, just spend all their money on him and destroy themselves in the long run. They might do that. You know, uh, World Series of Fight, like I said, you know, they got some money to throw around. They might sign him. But, of course, you know, the big thing we want to know is we don't care about it. We want to see Fedor in the UFC. And what would it take for that to happen? Now, I'm not really sure what all of the, the legal loopholes would be, all things have to kind of go through, uh, what things you have to sign with management in terms of this thing to happen, TV broadcast rights, all that stuff, the Reebok endorsement, I don't know. You know, it's, it's really complicated stuff. I don't know all the details, but I'm going to pretend I don't know all the details. But if I were the UFC, I would want to make this deal happen. Now, you don't really have to sign the UFC. Uh, the UFC doesn't have to sign Fatal or anything long term. I'm thinking you maybe do a 3-5 deal, absolute maximum. And here's what you do. You go in, you say, all right, Fedor, you want $2.3 million, we'll give it to you for three fights, which is pretty much a chump change for most pro sports, but really MMA, that's a huge amount. That's unprecedented, I would probably say. So you throw him all this money, you say, you give us three fights, we'll give you a marquee fight, we'll, we'll make your debut at UFC 200, we'll give you Fabrizio Verdun. We'll give you Andre Arlovsky. We'll give you whoever is, you know, the interim heavyweight champion at that time. Probably not Junior Dos Santos or Cain Velasquez because, frankly, they're too good. They have a chance to knock Fedor out. So you bring him in, Fedor, and like I said, I mean, you know, he's he's a pretty light heavyweight. I mean, not a light heavyweight, 205. I mean, for a heavyweight fighter, he's one of the smaller dudes, like 220. And, you know, I think he could probably do pretty well against, uh, I'm going to say, just about three quarters of the UFC heavyweight division. I mean, his chances are really good. I mean, I think he can definitely beat Andre Olarski again. I think he can beat guys like Ben Rothwell. He can beat Steve B. He can beat really pretty much everybody except for maybe, you know, the big three, Dos Santos, Velasquez, and Verdun. Although I do think in a rematch, Fedor might actually be the favorite against Verdun. Just throwing it out there, it's crazy, I know, but I would love to see that matchup happen. And the UFC, you need it because your heavyweight division for lack of a better term, is bad. Really, really bad. Uh, Verdum is not really going to put a Fanny's in any seats. I mean, he's a great fighter and all, but he doesn't have the appeal. Velasquez, never really connected with the Mexican audience, uh, not catching on the Hispanic fans after his fight against the Verdum where he gassed. I mean, it's clear he's got some problems. Uh, Junior Dos Santos, probably the best overall guy you have there, but like I said, you really can't market him. Uh, you really can't just put the Brazilian guy out there and expect, you know, the European audience to connect with him. Sorry, it's just the way it is. And, I mean, the rest of the, the division, I mean, Andre Orlovsky, uh, who else you got? Uh, uh, the dude that beats his wife, what's his name? Travis Brown, Josh Barnett, all guys who, uh, it's very questionable whether they can pass a drug test anymore. So, anyway, you know, I mean, you get all these guys together. I think Fedor, you can beat him. I think it's very reasonable. I think I'm not really sure, you know, how much uh, ability he's lost over the years or how much he's gained, maybe. But I think he stands a pretty good chance because in the UFC. And like I said, since he is a light, lighter heavyweight fighter, you can probably even get him dropped to a five or a five or two. And I'm not saying you're going to do Fedor versus John Jones or anything like that, but it's a possibility. You know, if he goes in there and he dominates that heavyweight matchup, you throw him the champion or you know the second contender. I mean, you give him a, a nice run at heavyweight, maybe consider extending his contract. Or, you know, if he goes in there and loses, it's a close fight, drop him down to a five, give him a couple fights against Ryan Bader and uh, all these other guys you really can't get over. And it's a win win for everybody. You know, fans, they want to see Fedor Milianenko. Uh, he's a big name. He's going to draw a lot of fans to the sport. You know, he's pretty much the original Brock Lesnar. He's just an all around great uh, draw to have your company. Now, whether he's going to want an insane amount of money, I don't know. Uh, whether he will actually do as good as he did back in the Pride days or even the Affliction days, really, by his guess. But, you know, when you just look at mixed martial arts as a sport, this is just such a weird instrument because you can never really count anyone out. I mean, I think probably the best example is Randy Couture. You know, he's a guy who came in there, he's an old dude, he's fighting a lot of hit most of his career, he gets beat up by uh, uh, Chuck Liddell, calls it quits, he says, you know what, maybe I can reassess myself. I'll, I'll go up a weight class, I'll come back, I'll fight Tim Sylvie, this dude, and outweighs me by like 60 pounds. And he goes in there, and he knocks him down with the first punch, and he just drums on him for uh, 25 
45 minutes, and it's to this day my all-time favorite UFC fight. You talk to your hardcore UFC fans, you tell them what their all-time favorite matches are, that coach horse and good fight's gonna be up there. And it's just such a magical moment that kind of transcends, you know, just being a good match, being something to really connect to as a fan. And fan or if you're an MMA fan, you have a strong connection to the last of her. I mean, growing up, you know, I watched him, he was like Vader. You know, he was like some superhero or super villain. Like this dude who wasn't really much a fighter as much as he was a force of nature, so he had that reverence. And you want to see him come back. You want to see him get that second win. You want to see him do that comeback. You know, you want to see him go out on top like Michael Jordan did in his second retirement as opposed to his third retirement. And, uh, you know, you look around, there are examples of this everywhere in uh, the UFC and MMA. Um, another example, Robbie Lawler. This is a dude who uh, 10 years ago was really a journeyman fighter going from promotion to promotion. You know, he's fighting for, what was it, Elite XC, Strike Force, you know, really a mid-carder at best. And now look at him. He's uh, the welterweight champion of the world, the legitimate welterweight champion of the world. So, you know, as always, you can't count anybody out. You just can't do it, you know. Uh, Fedor, he might be the fighter we remember him be. He may not, but there is a chance. And I think uh, considering, you know, the lack of stars UFC has now, I'm sorry, you know, John Jones, everybody hates his guts. He's suspended. Nobody in the heavyweight division for sure is catching on. Uh, Ronda Rousey, I think, is kind of a uh, false messiah. It's, I mean, yeah, she's drawn, but she's only drawn when she's been on a pay-per-view co uh Made made by Anderson Silva. And Anderson Silva is not the Anderson Silva he used to be. George St. Pierre gone. And really, the only true star you have is uh, Conor McGregor. And, you know, will Fedor Emelianenko be as big of a draw long term? Uh, absolutely not. But he's going to put uh, butts in seats. People will tune into a pay per view to see Fedor Emelianenko fight. And I will. I'll go out of my way to go see that fight if he comes to the UFC. So, you know, like I said, you know, the money is definitely going to be an issue. Um, really can't guarantee it's going to be a great long-term investment. Oh, wow, that was a terrible wreck over there. Oh, man, it's like a van, like, upside down. But, um, I think it's worth it. And maybe, hopefully, that's not, like, a parallel for what happens if UFC signs on Fedor. Hopefully, it won't be a, a colossal van wreck. It'll be something very beneficial for viewers, fans, and, uh, the MMA sport as a whole combined. But uh, yeah, pretty much all that to say, you know what, you're ringing in CM Punk, you really got money to throw around, you got money for the Reebok deal and the Fox deal, all your big stars are out, nobody's connecting. What would it hurt to sign Fedor to a very brief uh, multi-million dollar year, uh, year deal and, you know, get two or three fights out of him while he's still considerably in his uh, fighting room? Uh, condition. You know, five years down the road, he's going to be able to fight it all anymore. I think he still has that window of opportunity. And I think uh, there's certainly some risk to the possibility of doing the signing. But at the end of the day, going back to Couture Sylvia, so we're seeing Robbie Lawler today, I think the rewards far, far, far outweigh any negative uh, consequences of the UFC signing.